we often do this thing where if you have an identity, we add e to that, mm-hmm. and then we say ye banda Punjabi hai, for example, or ye banda Sindhi hai, <laughs> ye banda Arabi hai, Farsi, that type of thing. So I said, tell me about Balochi people, and uh, you kind of pointed out something yeah. interesting re- related to that that we don't really say Balochi. Mm-hmm. To, yep. uh, to identify people, we say just Baloch. Uh, yeah, I think this is uh, one of the first mistakes that most people get. And it's kind of like a running joke between Baloch community. But basically, yeah, in Baluchi language itself, Baluchi is the language and Baloch are the people. Mm-hmm. And it's the same as in Pashto is the language and Pashtun or Patan are the people. The, you can't use them interchangeably. So I think it's really just an innocent kind of mistake that people don't really realize they have. But I think but it also has to say a lot to the Pakistani education system that doesn't really focus on different identities and ha- having different ethnic backgrounds. Yeah. Is not really covered in Pakistani education system and like the media make this mistake all the time as well. Mm-hmm. I've heard very senior politicians making the same mistake. So yeah, yeah. just a future reference, Baluchi. Is the people and sorry, Baluchi. Oh, well, I'm making the same. Baluchi is a language. Yeah, <laughs> Baluch is a yeah, Baluchi is the language. Baluch as the people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you are Baluch by background. You speak Balochi, yeah. and the area is right. called Balochistan, of course. It's like a joke. A friend of mine, I think, saw my resume and he was like. What do you mean your name is Baluch? You speak Baluchi and you're from Balochistan? <laughs> it sounds like a skit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So my name is uh, Shiraz Baluch. Uh, I am originally from Karachi and um, I grew up in Dubai in my younger years, like until I was nine. And then my family, we moved back to Karachi where the rest of the extended family was. And I lived there until I finished high school. And then I went abroad to study, ended up immigrating to the U.S. after that. And I lived in China for many years as well to study Mandarin Chinese, and I was a teacher there. I uh, also worked in renewable energy sector in China. So I'd been moving around, but yeah, U.S. is home now. And originally I'm from Karachi, from this part of Karachi that has an indigenous Baluch community, like in Madir. There's two indigenous Baluch communities in Karachi. One's like a central in Layari, that is most mostly well known, but then there's another one spread out on the riverbeds where my family had settled hundreds of years ago. They immigrated from Balochistan and they settled there and yeah, and they were like farmers mainly. So they settled on riverbeds at mid ten. So yeah, that's a bit of my background. I am a development practitioner right now based in DC area. I work for the World Bank. Growing up in Pakistan, by the way, specifically in Mm -hmm. Karachi, you said, right? Of course, Mm -hmm. Karachi is, I think, one of the more diverse cities where a lot of folks come together from different, there are different provinces relatively compared to other cities in Pakistan. Karachi is more of a melting pot Mm -hmm. than others. I'm sure it was an interesting experience for you when you would reveal your Baloch identity. What what type right. of misconceptions or stereotypes did you hear from people <laughs> that you had to clear up? <laughs> yeah, I, I, that's a really good question. I like Karachi is such a fascinating place. I, I love it. I love, nowhere else in Pakistan even comes close. Sorry, no offense. I yeah. don't know. You see family from Lahore, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm Punjabi, yeah, from Lahore mostly. Yeah, no, Lahore Lahore is cool, trust yeah. me. But no, Karachi is something yeah. else. <laughs> and because it's so diverse, right? You have people of all backgrounds within pocket from Pakistan who are settled there. And then also I think something that a lot of people don't know about Karachi is that historically is it always had different groups of people from South Asia. There was a big Bengali community there until recently before partition, almost all different groups of people from from British India were settled in Karachi. So it's always been a very multicultural place. And and to me, that's why I love Karachi in a different way. But then again, like growing up in Karachi as being part of an ethnic minority, it's also has its challenges. Like most people in Karachi know that Polish people uh, live there, Mm -hmm. but there are general misconceptions. For example, one of the biggest stereotypes in Karachi is that what I used to hear is mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. like you know what I mean? They would always refer, they always think that all Baluch people are of African descent, mm-hmm. which we do have okay. a big community of people of, of East Africa who were brought to Baluchistan on the coast during the slave trade. One of the reasons we have prominent people of African descent within Baluchistan and Karachi is that when slave trade used to happen into subcontinent, it, used to, it, was, it was going through, a lot of it was going through Balochistan. 
So many of those people who are descendants of slaves mm. had stayed in the area. So in Karachi, there's a prominent afro baluch community in Leari. And that's the big stereotype is that, oh, like all Baluch people are of African descent. They should have darker skin than rest of us and curly hair. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, yeah. but that was like the first thing that would come along. Mm. And that would just be like, no, Baluch are of all different backgrounds. Most of us actually look different than what you have in mind, but they are also Baluch. But at the same time, the other like stereotypes are, that's I think common in the rest of Pakistan as well, is Baluch are uneducated, Liter- illiterate, mm. backward, that backward. And whenever people would meet me when I'm like in a work conference or if I was like in school and with debate teams and stuff, that would be the first reactions from like even very well educated senior teachers and professors to be like, kind of like jokingly, they would just throw this like, yeah, comment, offensive comment about, oh, you don't look like a balloon. You are quite educated. You yeah. look, you are you're very well read. What does that even mean? It might also come off as a backhanded compliment, right? Like for a Baloch, you're pretty, you're, you speak pretty well or you're educated. Yeah, I've thing, heard right? that as well, which. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Almost like a, condescending, yeah. basically, like, right? To me, that sounds kind of offensive. Yeah. Condescending, exactly. Yeah. It's the right word. Yeah. Yeah. So I think those are like the big uh, kind of the stereotypes that you will see um, is that, you know, they're uneducated. Oh, and then like also there's another like big narrative that the state has pushed is that oh, all Baloch people are, are tribal and they are uh, part of like tribes. So they are only benevolent to their tribal leaders and that's what that's who they listen mm-hmm. to. But it's not true. I mean, most Baluch actually live in a non-tribal community, in non-tribal societies. Mm-hmm. Southern Balochistan almost have no Sardars or feudal lords that you hear of from the government narratives all the time. And most of Southern Balochistan, Makran region, most Baluch in Karachi, most Baluch in Sindh, most Baluch who are in the Iranian side actually are not part of any tribal structure. Yeah. They live as like other middle-class Baluch. They are parts of like small towns, cities. So and that's a big kind of misconception as well. Another being like illiterate, backward. I, I don't know what's the word. I just saw the statistics and Cage district of Balochistan where Turbat is a big city. is one of the mm. highest literate districts in within Pakistan. I think some was like 70% literacy rate. And there was like a book festival that happened recently and I keep hearing it in podcasts and people keep citing it there and like saying that something like 7 million worth, 7 million rupees worth of books were sold in one day in a book festival in Balochistan. Wow. And it didn't surprise me because all I've known is that most Baluch are very curious to read. They're very much like the rest of Pakistan. There's different mm-hmm. kinds of Baluch yeah. and uh, there are people who like to read, there are people who don't like to read, there are people who, uh, you know, um, are educated, there are people who are not educated. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think that's just like kind of some misconception. Yeah, I'm yeah. curious how many Baloch people are living outside of Pakistan. And then secondly, do they distinguish themselves too? For example, we, Pakistan mm-hmm. comes in many different flavors in my mind. So, for example, Sindhi mm-hmm. folks will have their own culture, dances, music, food. Pashtuns, mm-hmm. ka bhi, you know, very rich kism ki culture uh, identity hai. Uh, Punjabis ki, of course, so that's yeah. everywhere. You see, for example, Coke Studio, uh, half of the songs are Punjabi and the other half are Urdu. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> our, our shows don't do a very good job of reflecting all the regions as well. Right. But yeah, Baloch mm-hmm. identity, do you think it's effectively being mm-hmm. shared by Baloch folks? And what are some things, for example, that we should mm-hmm. know and be able to spot and say, hey, that is definitely something from Balochistan? <laughs> That's a very good question. But the uh, first thing that I think that I identified myself was being Baluch because we spoke Baluchi at home, right? Yeah. And right. identity is something like you as yourself, you're an immigrant yourself, your family is of immigrant background. Identity is something you kind of add to yourself as you grow older or as you move along and have different hats of identities if you go around, right? Mm-hmm. And immigrant communities almost al- always uh, struggle with this, right? What are our identities? Am I an American first or am I Muslim or am I mm-hmm. Pakistani or Punjabi? But when it came to myself, like that's the first identity I have always had. And that's the most intact one I've always had throughout my life. Yeah. And I think it's attached to the language itself, right? The language is a rich um, language from the branches of um, older Persian. Um, the closest language to Baluchi is Kurdish oh, from interesting. Western Iran. Baluchi is on the Eastern Iranian side of the border. But when it comes to the grammar and the linguistics of it, wow. Kurdish and Baluchi are similar in that sense. So you don't really hear it. It's not as similar to Sindhi or Punjabi. Pashto 
has some like linguistic roots to Baluchi, but then it's a fit of a different yeah. branch itself, and just linguistically speaking. So identity itself for us is, I think, mainly comes to the language itself, mm. right? And then, well, according to census data, there are roughly around 10 to 15 million in Pakistan. And what's interesting is that a lot of people don't know is that there is a big part of Balochistan, historical Balochistan in Iran as well. Mm. And also a little part of uh, historical Balochistan where Baloch people live in Afghanistan. If you go by the, if you go ever across the border from Pakistan to Iran, you will see almost no difference. People speak the same language, they dress the same way, they have the same dialect, but they are cut off by a hard border. But if you look at the historical and cultural links, they're very close. Yeah. Like my own family, the reason I even got the name Shiraz is that my grandfather used to travel to the Iranian side a lot. And apparently I heard that mm-hmm. he either heard from someone that Shiraz is a really beautiful city or he had traveled there and he named me after the city in Iran. Yeah. So so that being said, that's the historical region. But then outside of that, Baluch diaspora in the West is very small. It's, it's more recent. Given the recent conflict, a lot of Baluch have moved to the West. But the Baluch diaspora actually within the region itself is very large in Oman, in the UAE, in the Gulf countries, mm. Baluch have had a big presence historically and culturally. One of the main reasons was the Oman, Omani Empire actually used to own Gwadar. So Gwadar is a city I used to belong to Oman until 1958. And Oman, when it was an empire, given that it had these string trade links right on the, on the Strait of Hormuz and Indian Ocean, also owned part of West Africa and Kenya. And a lot of people who were part of that empire, including the Baluch, used to go fight for the um, army uh, in Oman. They settled in Oman. It is still the second largest group of any ethnic groups mm-hmm. outside uh, after the Arabs and the, um, they call the Zanzibaris, are people who came almost from Zanzibar. Mm-hmm. Um, Baluch are, um, by census, are like the second largest ethnic group um, in Oman. And um, they're settled in Mombasa, Kenya. There's a small community. There's... There are Baluch that are also settled in Turkmenistan, a few of the tribes that like had migrated in Turkmenistan and it's about up to like 50 to 60,000. But outside of the historical Balochistan, I say within the region, especially if you go to the Gulf, in the Gulf of the Middle East, you'll meet a lot of Baluch in Oman, in Yemen, in Saudi Arabia, in UAE. And there, because they have been there for so long, a lot of people have also stopped speaking Baluchi, mm-hmm. but they will still use the surname Bunushi. At the end. So if you ever travel there, you will you may find a lot of people having the Baluchi surname, which is Baluch in Arabic because Arabic doesn't have the alphabet che. So you'll find that to be very common in, in a lot of Gulf countries, in Bahrain and Oman is and, and, and everywhere. Mm. And various parts of Pakistan as yeah. well, right? Like my family is technically in Sindh and Sindh, because its borders to Balochistan, has historically had a lot of Baluch tribes who moved there. Same in southern Punjab, you'll meet a lot of people who use last name as Baluch because they have historical links or either their families had moved there and settled there a long time ago. So, yeah, I think uh, you'll find that. Culturally, we're still very much part of the larger subcontinent and eastern Iran. So food-wise, there's a lot of similarities. You'll find the national national sta- staples everywhere. I think one of the biggest difference that I have noticed compared to the rest of the Pakistani mm-hmm. cuisine, which is something that we grew up eating and that most Pakistanis, have, especially from northern Pakistan, I've noticed are, are not familiar with, is seafood. Mm-hmm. Seafood is huge in Baluch cuisine. Oh, okay. Because we live on the, we've always lived on the coast. A lot of settlements are fishing settlements, fishing villages. So historically, people have been drawn towards seafood. And eating prawn, for example, is very common in Baluch communities. Yeah. While I've noticed that most of my friends were not from Karachi, or if their families were not from Karachi, even though they had lived in Karachi for their whole lives, they actually never tried things like prawn Correct. or other kinds of seafood yeah. because, yeah, because they just almost had this kind of disgust yeah. because they were not coast, so they never had tried it. They would probably eat fish once in a while, but it would still be very rare. Yeah. So, I think that they are the biggest kind of staple is seafood in mm. itself. But then, of course, I'm sure if you go to any restaurants in, in Pakistan, which have these national dishes from Balochistan, like saji and all these different styles mm-hmm. of cooking, these are very common. You'll find them and they kind of over, they kind of overlap between Baluchi cuisine and South Asian cuisine in, mm-hmm. in general. But I'd say I'd recommend if you ever travel or if you, even if you're in Karachi, there's places 
that you can go to and you yeah. can try seafood that local fishermen ca- uh, catch and then they will serve you like fresh seafood from the day. That's a big staple of like indigenous communities mm-hmm. there. I like to raise this um, issue of human rights violations from Balochistan as much as I can on my social media, mm. amongst so several friends. And these days it's so prominent that it's almost like a day doesn't go by when there's something new that's coming from Balochistan. Mm. Uh, I remember, for example, being a Pakistani American upbringing, you, yeah. you start at some point having a generational difference between your parents who were prominently raised over there. So on things like uh, even Bangladesh, right? Pakistan ki history may sometimes you hear a completely different perspective from the uncles and aunties than yeah. what you hear sometimes in the history books outside of Pakistan. So you start questioning these things. Yeah. Did you yeah. have that at yeah. a certain point in your life or yeah. at what age would you say you started kind of opening your eyes a little bit? Yeah, that's a really interesting trend that I have noticed more recently with the younger generation of Pakistanis. Uh, one of the things that I have honestly been like super impressed and surprise to a point is how much younger generations have mm-hmm. really broken chain of narrative that is that used to come from from the establishment from the state a lot about Balochistan. I'm seeing a lot more of the younger generations of Pakistanis. Um, of course, Baloch people have always been active about the issues that have been going there, but a lot of Pakistanis of non-Baloch background have actually started to question these human rights violations that are going in the province. I've noticed a new trend recently with the atrocities that are happening in in, in Palestine. Yeah. A lot of younger Pakistanis are questioning Pakistan's points when it's raising these human rights violations in the UN about Palestine is, okay, you talk about Palestine, that's great. There's been this issue that's been going on or close to home. Mm. What about that? And And I've been really surprised because Growing up when I was younger in Pakistan, like you would never hear that. Most people would yeah. only follow what was going on in the state media or what was allowed to be discussed in media in Pakistan. Okay. Um, so I have noticed that too. And I think definitely I give a lot of kudos to these folks. Uh, a lot of folks that I have interviewed on the podcast before who actually live in Pakistan. I'm talking about beast beast mm-hmm. sarke bache bachiya. They're mm-hmm. living in Pakistan. And uh, we, we know at this point how dangerous it can be, but they're quite vocal on their posts on social media about Balochistan, mm-hmm. uh, any mm-hmm. other kind of human rights issues going on in Pakistan. So it's very refreshing, especially uh, kind of mm-hmm. shaming to the fact that we have so many Pakistani immigrants here in the U.S. who mm-hmm. still haven't moved on from that. We're still kind of living like, nee, Pakistan se tha. Yahan pe hume, uh, yahan pe sab de do. Lekin Pakistan mein <laughs> yeah. That's what I never understand. Yeah, exactly. is what are yeah. what are we doing in the U.S. if not uh, for if we didn't come here for a better life? Yeah. But yeah, absolutely, you're right. I I I think that's a very encouraging thing about Pakistan. At least we're seeing the younger generation uh, becoming yeah. more more and more involved in these types of things. Yeah, yeah. I think it's less like social media is very prevalent. People can just go on Twitter and certain online news websites that are. Mm-hmm based within Balochistan and see what's actually going on instead of seeing and relying on the national media. Now, younger Pakistanis, a lot of younger Pakistanis of all different backgrounds have really started to question. That's a big trend that I have seen. But when it comes to ourselves, I mean, (laughs) our upbringing is different in that sense. I even had a friend, a very prominent journalist from Pakistan, asked me one time, he's like, why why are those people different in their approach and their thought when they think about these issues. I think it, it has a lot to do with the conflict yeah. itself. Like from a young age, we have known the atrocities that happen throughout our history in the 70s, in the 60s, uh, and how, how activists were imprisoned, were murdered. So we always grew up kind of questioning a lot of these narratives that were given by the state from day one. You were aware. Been kind of yeah. like unease. Yeah, and as I, unease between Baloch and Pakistan in how we combine the two identities. Mm-hmm. We like to take pride of in our ethnic identity, in our language, our national identity. And of course, there's a lot of Pakistanis who are proud to be both. But the state has always had this kind of problem that like, no, you should always call yourself Pakistani first. That being in a, a, a minority within a country itself, like it's almost learned that what happened with Bangladesh. Bengalis were not even 
a minority. They were actually a majority by numbers. And it was the first time that majority had said, leave us yeah. alone. We're going to go become a separate country because their rights were not mm-hmm. secure. So in the same way, Baluch have always read about these atrocities in Bangladesh, in, in the rest of Pakistan. And we have always tended to kind of question uh, a lot of these state narratives. Politically, a lot of the Baluch middle class have leaned left, like towards the politics of the left because of historical reasons. So there's been always this idea of questioning authority, questioning yeah. power. Bringing. And I will say that I've heard this many times. In principle, it sounds very nice for people to say, okay, yeah, you should call yourself Pakistani first. We are Pakistani first, then the rest of the rest of the Right? Mm-hmm. Meaning, when someone says, I'm Punjabi, I'm Punjabi, I'm Punjabi, I'm Punjabi, I'm Punjabi, I'm Punjabi, we kind of associate ourselves with that part of Pakistan more. For us, yeah. Punjabis are implicitly the real Pakistanis. I'm not saying all of us are mm-hmm. guilty of this, but <laughs> sometimes it happens. And we'll, yeah. Yeah, apnapan, apnapan, I think, yeah. is a trait of any person in any group mm-hmm. that they're going to be a part of. But it's just unfortunate that yeah. when, when you have a, a divide, oftentimes it's the majority that gets mm-hmm. the power and the authority over the others. Pakistan has started to make an identity crisis for itself. Like Pakistan, we had an identity crisis for itself. حالانکہ بہت سمپل ہے میرے خیال سے جو ہے وہ پاکستان میں آئیڈینٹی کرائسس جو ہے وہ انڈیا سے کم ہونی چاہیے کیونکہ کم نیشنلٹیز ہیں کم اتنے سٹیز ہیں پاکستان میں مذہب ایک حساب سے جو ہے وہ از نائنٹی نائن پرسینٹ آف دا پیپل آر فالوئنگ دا سیم ریلیجن از اونلی فور سٹیز لیکن ایسا کیوں ہے کہ پاکستان میں جو ہے وہ آلموسٹ از اے بگر کرائسس آف آف آئیڈینٹی آف ایتھنک Even more so now than, mm-hmm. than India, right? In India, how many uh, uh, groups are there? Okay. But like in, by law, by con- constitution, we have not secured these rights for Pakistan. Okay, I mean, in Pakistan, we have a identity crisis because we have tried to force it down people's throat. Okay, you have tried to force it down people's throat. Okay, you are Pakistani, so you must... Uh, speak Urdu. That's the only national identity. Yeah. Even though only 20% of people speak Urdu as their yeah. mother tongue in Pakistan. People from Pakistan have other languages. Yeah. And there, they are often called these regional languages mm-hmm. or there's almost like in this condescending yeah. ways to define right. them. But actually like those languages are way older than yeah. Urdu. Pashto ho gaya, Baluchi ho gaya, Punjabi ho gaya, Sindhi ho gaya. They're all much, much older than mm-hmm. Urdu. They're much richer than Urdu. They are actually indigenous to where Pakistan is as a land. Urdu, that was mainly a product of the Mughal courts in New Delhi and in, in Hyderabad and other places, mm-hmm. right? Um, so what's the problem with the identity crisis? Yeah. Let people exist, let people breathe in their own way, and then let them define their own identity. Say, 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 as be Pakistani Americans, right? America is not forcing us to take this, these identities. And we almost uh, always, as minorities here in America, question these issues. We're like, we don't want to be part of this big push to identify as one group. And so people are always reacting to this as Muslim minorities within America to have their rights preserved, right? And I think as, as been going through this process of being an immigrant here, One thing that's come to me really easily as becoming an American is just, it's just so easy to claim yourself as, a, as an American because nobody's pushing it down my throat. If I don't want to call myself an American, that's also fine. Yeah. So when we want those rights for ourselves over here abroad, why don't we want them for people who are minorities mm-hmm. back home, right? Like, why do we question that? Yeah. That's always something that I've struggled for. And then you get into these Ubers uh, with Chachas <laughs> and they're like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, but, but yeah, how come look minority? How pass a new one? That's very interesting. Also, so your tone changes when it comes to yeah. issues yeah. back home. I always right? find it really yeah. interesting when I think a lot of folks were very supportive of the Pakistani military up until recent years. Mm. For example, in this whole Balochistan thing, the conflict has been going on for a long time mm. with militant groups over there. And oftentimes what we would hear from the chachas and <laughs> the aunties and everything was, this is all a drama that India has done. India yeah. exacerbated kar rahe issue ko, yeah. and India is basically arming these groups against us because they want Balochistan to separate from Pakistan. So even if, for example, let's yeah. say India has an interest in Balochistan, um, which they might, right? Yeah. That doesn't, in my eyes, diminish the the essence of the issue here with what Baloch are dealing with mm-hmm. in Pakistan. Right? Yeah, I think you have to like think if it really has come to that point that 
if India is backing the different groups in Balochistan to try to secede from Pakistan, what is the reason that, that it, yeah. has, it has yeah. come to that? But then again, like my analysis as a student of international affairs mm. and political science is that it's almost non-existent what Pakistan has claimed of, of India's involvement in mm. Balochistan. There might be some evidence, right? There was one spy that was, who was arrested, but it's never come across with credible evidence that this has been going on because of mm. India. If you compare it to how much Pakistan has actually raised the issue of Kashmir in international forums, in UN, in in its own legislation, in international legislation, with this, the Pakistan has refused to have diplomatic ties with India, with the giant neighbor, to trade, to do other things because of Kashmir. Yeah. India never brings up the issue of Balochistan in international forums as much. So I think from a political analysis perspective, I look at this and I'm like, I don't see even the comparison. Mm. But then again, even if there is, why has the Baloch come to a point where he's happy to take India's side over, over Pakistan? Let's go, ba- let's go into it a little bit. What has been behind that? What's been going on for yeah. a long time, right? Like you might've heard the last time you might've heard about Balochistan was uh, when Akbar Bukti was killed in 2006. Yes. Yeah. But then here and there you hear about it, but uh, for us, it has been nonstop. It's been going on since mm-hmm. then. It's been almost 20 years now. So if there is a way, in, in a way, Pakistan hasn't, the, the central of Pakistan hasn't been able to resolve this conflict for more than mm-hmm. 20 years. It's in in a way, it's in its own failings, right? It should have been able to resolve this issue yeah. for a time. So just to understand this issue a little better, uh, Shiraz, like the average Baloch person, what is their perspective? How... Do they perceive Pakistan as a whole or the Pakistani government, right? The feeling of resentment that they have, I'm mm-hmm. sure, of being wronged. And then secondly, mm-hmm. what is a fair resolution in their mind? So, yeah, I think I wouldn't be able to give the answer for an entire community of Bolish people of mm-hmm. what they want, right? But I can try to like bring a few points here that I think people should understand why the issue has come mm-hmm. to this now. There's been historical injustices, there has been conflict throughout Baluchistan's history with Pakistan. In the 70s, there was a huge conflict. More than 5,000 um, people in Baluchistan were killed in military, under military occupation, under civilian government of Zulf Karali Bhutto at the time. He was a civilian prime minister, but Baluchistan itself had a governor type, like military governor type a government, which launched a military attack of Pakistani army going into Balochistan right after Bangladesh because they were really scared that this could be another big issue mm-hmm. that could break Pakistan apart. So that happened in the 70s a lot. And then I think what you really understand in the modern sense is the last 20 years, especially since the killing of Akbar Bhutti in mm-hmm. 2006. What most people don't understand, what, what most people don't get is that they would remember the issue on Akbar Bhutti and they thought, oh, like, he had some some differences with uh, Musharraf and he wanted to go against the government. So he started a war against the government and Musharraf killed him. What, what people forget often is that Akbar Bukti yeah. himself was one of the most pro-Pakistani Baloch that ever existed mm. among the most powerful people because he was one of the first ones who welcomed Jinnah in Balochistan. He was the governor of Balochistan in the 1970s. He was a member of parliament several years. He was a uh, chief minister at times as well. But when he was trying to negotiate these issues around the natural resources of Balochistan, how much share should go to the center, how much share should go to the province, among these negotiations that were still going on, I would remember, I remember I was a kid and for a lot of Baloch, even at that time, Akbar Bukti was some, somewhat of a controversial figure. Like, because people had remembered him taking the government side in the 80s when there was military occupation in Balochistan, there was like military operations within villages in, in Balochistan and people were killed. He was part of the government at the time. For a long time, he was sort of this controversial figure who was uh, a tribal lord, but at the same time, he was like a poet, a really well-read writer. And he was kind of this really charming character who was like really into English literature. But then at the same time, he had, he made people walk on fire to, to do tribal justice and all that. So among the lot of the middle class Baluch, he was also a very controversial figure because they had seen him as this person who had represented some of the worst part of our society. 
And what happened in 2006 is among these negotiations that was going on with the military dictator at the time, he gets mm. killed, right? He gets assassinated without any negotiations happening on the table. Uh, one of the big things that happened during Upper Bukti negotiations were that really brought the whole issue to a boiling point, which people forget, is that a female doctor was raped in mm. Balochistan, near in, in near Dera Bukti, in Sui. And people of Dera Bukti had demanded that the military officer who had raped this lady doctor should be persecuted. Of course, they were asking for doing a sort of a tribal persecution of this person because it had happened under their tribe, to tribal jurisdiction. You can disagree on that for sure, but then this trial never happened. The lady was asked to leave Balochistan and then eventually Pakistan because the military officer wasn't tried. Musharraf had openly come out and backed the military officer. And he had even said that Ashadiyya Khalid, who was raped, these are women who like to just want to move abroad and <laughs> they want to uh, claim asylum abroad. And that's why they claim these kind of issues on rape and stuff. So he backed the military officer. And on that, like the entire Bukti tribe, because of the honor of, of, of the code of ethics, that's part of the honor is that if you have a tribe, if you have a guest in your community and if they're harmed, you have to go to war mm -hmm. against them. The, 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 the Bukti tribe had announced that they will go and uh, start um, attacking the military officers, the military camps that were in mm -hmm. the jurisdiction. People often forget how important that issue was. Yeah. Anyways, Akbar Bukti gets killed. And I remember that's where even middle class Baluch had drawn the line. Even before that, he was controversial. We had mixed opinions about him. But I remember coming back from school and all my family standing in front of the TV and my, my parents crying. My uncles were upset because an elder of the community he was almost 80 years old. He was one of the most prominent Baluch leaders, had been brutally killed with his body not even shown to his family, locked in a coffin and anonymously buried in Dera Bukti somewhere. And it was revealed later where he was buried. Nobody knew if he would, if it was even him in such disgraceful situation. I remember walking into my house and I remember that's when I realized that how big of an issue this was. And that's where we kind of drew the line. We were like, no matter how controversial the guy was, but this is absolutely unjust of how he was killed. And like, most people kind of had drawn the line and at that point. And then since then, issue the issue has just mm -hmm. gotten worse, where the center has even that tried to use more force, more brutality to try to repress this voice that's coming from mm -hmm. Balochistan. And the center of violence mm -hmm. has continued. After Bukti's killing, there were protests that, that happened. There were some groups of, of, of uh, political parties in, in Balochistan that had started announcing that they want to secede, they want to separate from Pakistan and they were, they wanted to do it peacefully and without listening to what they were saying or without trying to debunk their arguments, mm -hmm. like people were picked up at first, a lot of these people were uh, abducted by the Pakistani intelligence agencies, tortured, and then they were let go in like early, early, uh, about 2008, 2007. After that, the, start, the state started a policy to just abduct them and kill them and dump their body somewhere randomly in, in, in the middle of mm. nowhere. Which, uh, wow, yeah. Mr. Golam Ahmad Baloch, is a prominent example of that. He was head of the political party of Baloch National Movement. And at the time, I remember as, as being as impartial as I can, being from somebody who was from Karachi, these groups were kind of small. They actually weren't that powerful yeah. in their messaging. But the more the state used these kind of brutal tactics, the more their voices grew because everybody realized that if you can't even ask for certain rights non-violently in a peaceful way, and this is how the state reacts, then it might, I'm just maybe I'm better off to just go and become a yeah. rebel. And a lot of these circle of, uh, kind of violence had continued from there. And then people were started getting abducted um, yeah. and then either killed um, a few years, a few months later, or a few years later, or um, there are some people that have been abducted and there is no sign of uh, where they are. It's been more than 10 years, 15 years. One of the activists right now who is protesting, Sami Deen Baloch, you'll mm -hmm. probably see in her line of her post, her dad has been missing for more than 15 years. And then some of these protesters are saying, if they're dead, yeah. just at least tell us like where they're buried. Or even if they're, you don't know where they're buried, just tell us they're dead. We have been waiting for these, well, our loved ones, our brothers, our fathers, 
our uncles for more than 10 years, for more than five years, for more than 15 years. We don't even know where they live. And that's even worse than at least finding out if somebody's dead, right? Because you're like, you're said you come to the, you come at least to some kind of realization that they're dead, you grieve for them, and then you move on with your life. But imagine not knowing about your father for 15 years, if they are even alive or dead. And that's been, that's why this recent uh, killing in Torbat of a young student, Balach, who was first abducted by the, there's a, a new department called the Counter for Terrorism Department, CTD, which works with the police and intelligence to fix up people they think they are suspicious. And then he was released to his family. He was brought to court and he was told that they were told that, okay, he has admitted to his crimes. He has said he's, he's a militant and all that, but he would try it. He'll be tried according to the to the public courts mm-hmm. in Pakistan. His family at least sighed a sigh of relief. Okay, whatever it is, like we know he's alive. He's and then two days later, his body was blown up in a car, and they alleged that it was because the militants tried to attack the CTD, and Balach had taken sides with the militant, even though there was no sign of any attack or any injuries on the sides of the forces or the police or the CTD. But these students who were abducted, mm-hmm. who had been abducted were blown up mm-hmm. in a car. This is how horrible it was. And then the families came out, refu- they refused to bury his body. And their claim was that he was a militant, just at least should have tried him. If there was something wrong, if he had broken the law, try him in a public yeah. court. What is this new tactic before they were abducted and uh, tortured, but now you're abducting them and then just um, blowing them up in cars or like in stage encounters, telling that, saying that basically they were trying to attack the forces. Just the, the absolute gruesome way that the state has tried to use has made the world situation yeah. even worse. And then all these families came out and they basically are saying that enough is enough. We want to know where our loved ones are. Even if they're dead, just tell us where they are. And this is a very fair demand. This is a demand under the Pakistani constitution, which saves the rights of all people um, to be tried in a fair trial. Um, they're asking for a very legal and constitutional right mm-hmm. of their loved ones. So it's important to know that's where the situations mm-hmm. come to. The voice of a uh, Polish missing person is a bol- political group that cites that there's more than 5,000 people Still who are missing. missing currently. Yes. And these are facts that are also being backed by different NGOs, different view and studies as well. That often brings a number to somewhere between 1,000 to 5,000. And the state itself has actually... <laughs> said recently the last government said, yeah, we have about 50 people who are missing, but we don't know where they are. And that was even worse. It was like, okay, if there are only 50, then just try to find where they are. If it's one thing, if it's 5,000 and you don't know where they are, but yeah. you're trying to minimize the issue and saying that they're only 50, then maybe that's, that's easier. So you are kind of like making it like it's a bigger failure that even if there's 50 people, like, and you don't know where they are, that makes the situation yeah. even worse. And then I also read, by the way, and it, this one yeah. kind of shocked me to read that right. there were some people that actually left Pakistan and then they mysteriously died. Mm-hmm. Mysteriously, they died abroad. Al Jazeera was reporting yeah. on this that there's a woman named Karima Baloch and she was a 37-year-old Pakistani human rights activist. And she was found dead in her home in Toronto, Canada in 2020. And then another guy, Sajid Hussein, was a 39-years-old Pakistani journalist mm-hmm. found dead in Sweden. Both cases... Mm-hmm apparently were ruled to be suicide. Mysteriously happened in 2020. Right. And both drowning cases. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know the exact uh, details of how they passed away. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, that's very scary. And they've tried to use these kind of tactics in for all different activists or, or journalists or writers from Pakistan who even live abroad mm-hmm. to try to silence them. And other countries have done the same, right? So you saw what happened with Jamal Khashoggi in Turkey mm, yeah. and recently with the whole controversy between Canada and India. And yeah. yeah, it's very alarming. I think people leave their countries, people leave their families, their their loved ones to be safe, not because they want to live abroad. Nobody wants to nobody wants to be away from where they grew up, where they who they love. They mm. leave to to be safe. But if they're not even safe to be elsewhere, mm-hmm. that's a question to the host countries as well, to places like Canada places like Sweden yeah. and other places where activists of all backgrounds, not just Pakistanis, but of all backgrounds of, for, from all over the world, if they're not safe, then these states, these countries need to do better. Yeah. But I think you, you asked about what is it the Baluch want yes, and yeah. what is the core issue, right? Yeah. Um, 
What is it like greater investments from government or better representation? Mm -hmm. I think, honestly, knowing the Baloch as I know, the issue is very simple. I think people try to really get into the different aspects of the conflict, like over it's because of better representation, they should have more money, they should have better investment, then the Baloch people will be happy. But I think what, you know, Baloch issue, it really comes down to my, to my analysis, really comes down to the fact that the Baloch don't want to become a minority within their own region. Mm -hmm. They have a very large uh, province, a very large chunk of land, but with a very small population. Yeah. The Baloch have always feared that, that they will be turned into a minority within their own lands. Mm -hmm. And it's not that they're against development. I'm a development practitioner. I see these lens of, uh, of, of, of development of how indigenous people see development and how like central governments see development is different. People who are indigenous to Balochistan, people who are from there, they want development as well, but they want it in their own way. They don't want it to be um, shoved down their throat and people from different parts of Pakistan benefiting from this development, mm -hmm. moving into places like Gwadar and turning them uh, a minority in their own land. Yeah. That has always been the core crux of the issue. Mm. I think demographic change has been one of the biggest fear of the Baluch. They want to have safeguards within their own land, within their own province, that they want to be, you know, represented and also more control over their own natural resources. Balochistan has vast minerals, natural resources mm -hmm. that are mined. Uh, the central government gets a lot of revenue out of that, but it's almost never invested back in Balochistan or in the local communities. Mm -hmm. People see this in Balochistan as an override theft of their natural, of their national wealth. Mm -hmm. They say, they ask that we should have a fair share. The fair share doesn't mean that this investment or this benefit of money should go to the province, to the provincial government, because then it goes to the corrupt pockets. Mm -hmm. It should be invested in a more fair way back into the communities, mm -hmm. there should be, if there's mining happening, let it happen, but hire the engineers, train the engineers from those local places. Yes. If there is a copper mine or if there's a gold mine, build the plants and process them where it's happening locally and those people are also benefiting, benefiting it from it equally. Yeah. And then of course, the, the state can also benefit. This, these things happen everywhere mm -hmm. in the world. Like all countries, all good uh, governments try to find a, a solution to these issues, but the state have just kind of use this as an excuse to just use most brutality. And they think that they can just use brutality and try to, to crush, uh, crush all these voices. Even the people who are, who want to, who have legitimate concerns of bring more literacy into Balochistan, invest more in education, invest more in health, don't turn us into a minority. They're just be, they get crushed. And of course, the, sec the, the circle of violence goes, cycle of violence goes, the more you use brutality, that there you will create more rebels. Mm -hmm. You will create more people who will be angrier mm -hmm. than they were before. Yeah. I say, let the Baluch people decide what they want for their future. I can't say that as one individual, but at the same time, like there's different groups of Baluch as well. There are Baluch who want outright secession. They want outright a separation from Pakistan. And then there are Baluch who are in the middle, who um, accept a democratic peace process of uh, having elections, of having votes that they're called nationalists, like, and then there are Baluch who are um, also part of the national parliament and they go to elections, they have representation. And then there are also Baluch who are backed by a military establishment. So it's not there's one group of Baluch who won one and something who are more powerful than the other. Yeah, but what you, what you just outlined here is actually very important. Pakistani government, right? You have a responsibility, you have some accountability here. It's never, and I, I can't believe they actually think that this is a sustainable solution to just start suppressing voices as if it'll just magically disappear and people will stop wanting things and they'll just live with the status quo. Especially in this day yeah. and age, you're not going to be able to shut down voices and yeah. nor should you be able to. We are living in a world where Muslims, especially in a, in a state of oppression in various parts of the world, right? Yeah. And like you mentioned earlier in the podcast, it should be even more concerning when it's happening under our own noses. 
whether it's happening to other Muslims yeah. or non-Muslims. It could be happening to anyone. Or, and if it's happening by other Muslims as well, right? Yeah. Relation between the oppressed and the oppressor is never around one yeah. core identity of religion or ethnicity or language. Yeah. An oppressor is an oppressor and an oppressed is oppressed. So, mm -hmm. and it can, it should be used, it should be seen in different contexts. And in this context, I mean, you've seen the Baluch are saying that if you, as the establishment of Pakistan, I'm not saying all Pakistanis, but like generally as Pakistani uh, history goes, if Pakistan was made separated out of British India on the fear that Muslims didn't want to be a minority within India because they feared that if they would stay in India, they would they remain a minority, their right to wouldn't be preserved, so they wanted to have a homeland of themselves. Mm -hmm. Baluch also see their case in the same way, <laughs> but from a national and ethnic identity that they don't want to be turned into a minority in their own land. So if people who are Pakistani background uh, know their own history, and if they know what happened with Bangladesh, they should be able to very easily understand why this is. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that no one should be allowed to go and live in Balochistan. Mm -hmm. Of course, people will be, it, it should be allowed to go and live there. But with certain rights for the indigenous people, that they should always have the right to be represented in a majority as they are. I don't know if, if, if how Punjabis feel about this, because most Punjabis probably wouldn't understand because they are from a, a, a group, an ethnic group that is that has a big population. But imagine if all of a sudden entire Sindh had moved into Punjab mm -hmm. and Punjabi started becoming a minority within their own region. I'm sure they would, be would have yeah, something sure. to say about that, yeah, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's very natural. That's very common. That's human psyche. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's important to see it from that yeah. lens for sure. And more investments, more pet projects of building a cricket stadium or building a highway is not going to resolve this issue. There have been more investments from the Chinese, but in fact, it just made the situation even worse. Mm -hmm. In Gwadar, people are saying now that we were better off when there was no investment from the Chinese. At least we could go fish in our own seas. But now the Chinese have built a port and they are stealing our fish from our ocean that we have lived here for hundreds of years, that we can't even go and fish in our own waters anymore. Yeah. Let alone uh, these big industrial projects or highways or investments that will modernize the whole region. They're saying we can't even fish anymore. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's important to understand and also to respect. I think it wouldn't be a beautiful Balochistan if you went there and there was no Baluchi speaking people yeah. or if there was no uh, indigenous people that lived there. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if I'd want to go to a Balochistan that looked like that. Yeah, absolutely. It'd be like Cancun. I don't know if you've ever been, but It'd be like, yeah, you're just <laughs> hanging around this little beach yeah, area exactly. surrounded yeah. by other Americans <laughs> enjoying tacos. <laughs> and then you're, you say you saw Mexico. Well, maybe you didn't really see Mexico. You just yeah. saw a resort. <laughs> yeah. Now we are just like in Pakistan, where people come from Punjab, they never see their lives in Punjab. So they ask them to 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 ask them. So last question for you, Shiraz, was any resources what are some ways that listeners can, first of all, by learning about this issue, reading books and things like that, and then secondly, well, you know, how can we spread more awareness in your viewpoint? Yeah, thank you. I think I'll, yeah, I'll recommend a few sources, especially for younger listeners of the podcast. Mm -hmm. One of the first thing, one of the first one I would recommend is give a follow to Balochistan Times. They have a good following on uh, Instagram. It's a newspaper that is based out of journalists from Balochistan run from abroad, but it is run by Balu journalists and mm. they have a big following on Instagram. Go give a follow to Balochistan sometimes, go to their website. They post on this issue on a regular basis mm. on what happens from local sources, from local journalists. And when it comes to books, I think, yeah, there are some books that have covered the issue in, in, in from different lenses. There are books that have been written by foreign scholars from foreign authors. There have been books that have been written by Pakistani scholars and Baluch scholars as well. So I think I would recommend definitely having a read of Jan Mahmud Dashti's essays on Baluch nationalism mm -hmm. in Pakistan, if you really want to understand what it, what is it that the Baluch think and what do they Mm -hmm. want. That would be a really good book. It's from a while ago, 
I think like from like maybe 40, 30, 40 years ago. Mm-hmm. But uh, they're just uh, kind of scholarly essays on on different issues on and, uh, the history of Balochistan, on what the conflict is, on what the language is, on what the identity issues are. And and, and, and are these in English, by the way, these essays? Yes, Jan Mundeshi's book is actually available on Amazon. So it's, it's okay. available for 20, 25 bucks. Another book that I have, um, Milian Merck's as book on Balochistan at a Crossroads is a really good mm. book that you can have in your library or on your coffee table that is also from more recent times. He traveled around Balochistan in the mid-2000s around the killing of Abdel Bukti and then the protests afterwards with a French photographer. And Balochistan at a crossroads has very beautifully taken photographs along with essays on interviews with different activists and government officials and scholars on which really will give you an idea of, of what the current issue is. For most listeners who are of Pakistani background, Pakistani Americans, mm-hmm. or people of Pakistani diaspora, I think it's important that you should understand that Pakistan is a multi-ethnic, multinational democracy, and the rights of indigenous people should be protected. We have done a terrible job of promoting indigenous languages, Baluchi, even I get worried about Punjabi sometimes mm-hmm. where I feel like most Punjabis have stopped taking pride in their own language and taking pride in their ethnic identity. It's almost as seen something as like backward, but I don't understand why. For us, Baluch, that's the biggest pride for us is our folklore, our poetry, language itself, our literature. I think Pakistanis should try to take, take pride in that. You gave an example of Coke Studio. It's done a great job of bringing this these different identities of different backgrounds to the surface. So you can see how beautiful it is. And I say, take pride in that and try to understand different languages as well. I feel sad sometimes that you go to a place like Balochistan, where most people are multilingual. They speak Baluchi, they speak Bravi, they speak Pashto, they speak Urdu, they speak Mm -hmm. English. But when you go to Karachi, most people will speak Urdu and they speak English. They will have, Mm -hmm. they don't understand like any other indigenous languages like Sindhi or Baluchi or Punjabi. So I think that's that's my first message is that take pride in the indigenous people who have lived in Pakistan and their culture and their identity and their in, in their backgrounds. And we should also learn from the mistakes from the past and understand the the love that people of different places have for their land. I would end it with the last message from a line in Baluchi that I love to often say is Wahe Watan Ushke Dar translation to Though barren, the motherland is worth everything. Means wow. even the Balochistan is very barren. If it desert, like there's nothing mm-hmm. there. But people of Balochistan love their land. They love their culture. They love their language. Yeah. So for them, that is worth everything. Thank yeah. you so much. And keep in touch. And whenever you're in DC yeah, area, absolutely. let's get absolutely. together. Yeah. 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 All right. Thanks All right. a lot. We'll be in touch. Yeah. All right. You have a wonderful. Yeah. Take bye-bye. care. Bye.